Hello and welcome to the session in which we will discuss what is GAAP, what is the purpose of GAAP, and who sets GAAP, Generally Accepted Accounting Principle. This topic is important if you are studying for the CPA exam or if you are an accounting student taking intermediate accounting. Whether you are a CPA candidate or an accounting student, I strongly suggest you take a look at my website, farhatlectures.com. I don't replace your CPA review course. I am a supplemental material. I am a useful addition to your CPA review course. So I can explain the material differently, which in, which in turn will help you with your CPA preparation, which in turn will help you to pass your CPA exam. Your risk is to try me for one month. Your potential gain is passing your CPA exam. And if not for anything, take a look at my website to find out how well your university is doing on the CPA e exam. I do have resources for other accounting courses, intermediate accounting, governmental accounting, basic accounting, uh, so on and so forth. I have resources for your CPA exam organized by your review course. I also have the AI CPA previously released question. I strongly suggest you take a look at my website. Also connect with me on LinkedIn if you haven't done so. Like this recording, share it with others, connect with me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit. So what is GAAP? What's the purpose of GAAP and who sets GAAP? Before we talk about this, we need to remember the objective of financial reporting. What is the objective of financial reporting? Very straightforward. To provide useful financial information to investors and creditors because those two groups risk their money risk their capital. Therefore, let's provide them as much information as possible to make a decision. That's good. That's fair enough. The question is, how do we provide this information? In other words, let's assume um, we have three companies, company A, B, and C, and each one of them prepare their financial statements using a different sets of accounting rules. Well, it's going to be very difficult for the investor, for the venture capital to make a decision. Therefore, there's a need for, by investors and creditors to facilitate comparison. So I can compare all three companies and make a better decision. Well, what I need is the same sets of rules, the same sets of broad and specific guidelines that's going to help me make that decision. And those broad and specific guidelines that companies should follow in preparing financial statements is called GAAP, Generally Accepted Accounting Principle. It's pronounced like the GAAP store. So GAAP they will tell the companies how to measure the transaction, how to record the transaction at historical cost, at fair value, how to report this information under financial statements. How does this transaction fits in your balance sheet, fits in your income statement? How does it affect your profitability? And what to disclose in the notes of the financial statements, also the related notes. The question is, who sets gap? So, okay, we have gap. Let's assume it's a book. Who sets GAAP? Well, we need to know who sets GAAP. Who sets accounting standard? Let's talk about in general or in theory. In theory, Congress can set accounting standard, but they do, usually they don't do that. So who really sets accounting standard? Well, Congress technically delegated this process to an organization called the SEC. Now, we need to talk a little bit about the SEC. What, what is the SEC? When was the SEC born? Well, the SEC was born as a result of the stock market crash. Well, the stock market crash was the result of misleading and ins insufficient financial information provided to the investors. So back in the 1920s, investors were investing money in companies that it did not really exist. And if it existed, it, did, it wasn't doing as well as it was claiming to be doing. So the SEC said, you know what we need? The Congress said, let's create an organization to restore the confidence in the stock market so people will invest again in the stock market. So in response, the SEC was born to restore investor confidence. This is, this is the SEC role, is to kind of basically oversee the financial market. There are two important acts uh, in the SEC, especially when the SEC was actually created, and to restore the confidence, and those are the 1933 Securities Act and the 1934 Exchange Act. Let's talk about the 1933 Securities Act. The 1933 sets the accounting rules and disclosure for IPOs. IPOs are initial public offering for stocks and bonds. It's when the company is selling stocks and bonds for the first time. That's a dangerous process. The investors don't know anything about this company. It's a new company and they're asking you for money. Well, guess what? The SEC said you have to disclose certain information. Now this topic, the SEC 1933 and 1934, it's covered, it's covered in your auditing exam, it's covered in your BEC exam, and I believe it's covered also in RAG under, under business law. So you need to know a little bit about the SEC for each CPA exam, and it's also covered on FAR a little bit. But all you need to know for intermediate accounting is 
1933 oversees the initial public offering. And that's important because there's not much known about the company before this process. The 1934 Securities Exchange Act, notice the word exchange. It's when investors are exchanging their stocks, buying and selling their stocks. It's a secondary market. It's no longer the company going from initial public offering to the public. Now the public is exchanging stocks among themselves. Now here we need to set the rules because now the company is publicly traded. It's, it's everybody is buying their stocks. What, what do they need to do? They need to do this periodic reporting. The 1934 set the rules for reporting requirement. You have to report every three month quarterly reporting. You have to report your financial statements on an annual basis. You have to disclose if there's any major event. So this is what the 1934 deals with. But that's basically what the role of the SEC mainly for our purpose. But the SEC really don't set the rules, the accounting rules. It delegate this process to the private sector. Now let's talk about a little bit more about the private sector. We're going to go basically through a short history lesson. From, from, from the private sector perspective, the Committee on Accounting Procedures was the first, first private sector standard setting body. The committee that oversees this is called the American Institute of IAIA, that's the name for it, and it was the National Professional Organization for Certified Public Accountant. Now, hopefully you know what's the National Professional Organization now. The National Professional Organization is the American Institute of Certified Public Accounting or the AICPA. Some people, the AICPA was renamed to replace this organization. And this is where the AICPA was born. Now, if you are not a member of the AICPA, you should be, whether you are a CPA or student there's a student membership you really want to be a member so this way you can network see what's going on in the industry it might open doors for you the committee on accounting procedures issued research bulletin and they issued 51 of them but they were called research bulletin there was no theoretical framework and they approach each issue on a piecemeal approach so they only responded when an issue was presented to them they were not active they just looked at each issue separately they did not look at the full picture the CAP was replaced by the Accounting Principal Board. The Accounting Principal Board, they issued opinions, okay? And the reason I'm emphasizing those two words, research bulletin and opinion, because on the CPA exam, who knows, you may get a question about this topic, or on my exam, you may get a, you may get a question about this topic, right? The members of the Accounting Principal Board were volunteers, mostly CPA. There was a lot of criticism about this board. It did not react fast enough to accounting changes. Part of it because maybe maybe because they were volunteers. It was also charged with favoring public accounting interests. Again, could be because they are mostly CPAs, and they excluded other interested groups like government, uh, educators, analysts, the private sector, and it did not have a theoretical framework. So APB was eventually replaced by FASB, and this is what we have now in 1973. So APB went from 1959 to 1973. In 1973. Till the present, we have FASB. Now, you need to know a, a thing or two about FASB. Um, in response to the criticism, obviously, of the previous committees, it represents the various constituencies, such as auditing profession, profit-oriented companies, accounting educators, financial analysts, governments. So it include, it's more inclusive. It's a seven full-time members that represent all these, somehow, the, the interests of all these groups. The, uh, the It's supported by the Financial Accounting Foundation, that's the committee that oversees this FASB. Um, 1984, they established the Emerging Issue Task Force. That's something you need to be aware of. And the reason is to, to, to respond quickly to accounting issues. Remember, one of the criticisms was you were not responding fast enough. So it's provide information about implementation and resolve accounting issues. So if FASB issued a standard, well, they may need some implementation guidance. Well, EITF will do so. If there's a no issue, they will speed up the standard setting process. It will give you an answer for now. Work with it until we issue, until we officially issue a standard about, you know, let's assume stock options or cryptocurrency, how to deal with cryptocurrency. So the rulings eventually are ratified by FASB and are considered gaps. So this is basically the EITF. They'll give you a quick answer for now until FASB kind of make a, a ruling standard called the accounting uh, issued what's called accounting standard updates until they issued an account, accounting accounting standard update or asus you have to look at what the eitf is telling you the fasb developed the conceptual framework now if you pro if you notice in the prior 
for the prior two organization. I kept mentioning there is no theoretical framework. Well, FASB did develop a theoretical framework called, called the conceptual framework. It's not part of GAP, and we're going to talk about the conceptual framework much, much more in details in the next in the next session. But you need to understand that the conceptual framework is the theoretical framework for GAP. Okay, now we have a theoretical framework, and we'll, don't worry, we'll talk about this a little bit more in details. So FASB, as I told you earlier, it issues Accounting Standard Update, or ASU, so when this is when the ruling is final. In 2009, what they did, they took all the opinions, all the research bulletins, and all the ASUs, and they codified them into something called the Accounting Standard Codification. So integrating and topically organizing all relevant accounting pronouncement, comprising gap and a searchable online database. So what they did, they took everything that this organization issues over the years, organized them in a database that's searchable. They also included anything that's relevant from the SEC, any portion of the SEC accounting guidance. So simply put, the codification is organized into nine, top, nine main topics and approximately 90 subtopics. And these are the nine topics, general principles, presentation, assets, liabilities, equity, revenues, expenses, broad transaction, and industry. And within each topic, you have subtopics. And part of the CPA exam is to know how to search this uh, accounting standard codification, how to quote from the codification. It's going to help you tremendously for the exam, but one of the simulation could be just to look up a specific codification process. At the end of this recording, I'm going to remind you whether you're an accounting student or a CPA candidate to take a look at my website, farhatlectures.com. No, I don't replace your CPA review course. I'm a useful addition. You can try me. I have helped hundreds, if not thousands, of students pass the CPA exam. Also, if you're looking for resources for your accounting courses, I do have that as well. Invest in your career. Invest in yourself. Good luck. Study hard. And of course, stay safe. The CPA is worth it.